Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Be Bold America. Our program today is Around the Political World with John Rothman. And who is John Rothman, you might ask? John F. Rothman is a renowned radio talk show host, popular lecturer and political and foreign policy consultant. John has been a professor at the University of San Francisco's Fromm Institute since 2004, and he's been involved in many political campaigns on the national, state, and local levels. John has published a wide range of articles and books on education, the Middle East, and on American political history. Today, John Rothman hosts a popular podcast called Around the World with John Rothman. One interesting fact is that John has a 15,000-volume library that is one of the finest private libraries in the country, specializing in American political history and political biography. John knows politics, and we need to know more. We have big things to do. Welcome back to Be Bold America, John. May I say it's a great pleasure to join you. Well, yes, you may. I love that. (laughs) Well, the first thing on my mind, John, and thank you for being here, well, is to start with Donald Trump's felony convictions this past week. What are your thoughts on his convictions and what ramifications do you now expect? The last time Trump lost, he unleashed stochastic terrorism on the U.S. Capitol. I'm kind of afraid of what he might do next. What are your thoughts? Well, let's begin by saying that uh, Donald Trump was convicted of a felony. Uh, There were, as you know, 34 counts. He was convicted on each one of them. Uh, And I think that is really the major headline. He's guilty. Uh, There is some talk of uh, his making an appeal. He might. Uh, In fact, I'm sure he will. I don't think it'll go anywhere. And as for the discussion about the Supreme Court overturning this conviction, I don't think that's in the cards. The simple truth is Donald Trump uh, now leads a political party that is going to nominate a convicted felon. And that is the most stunning thing of all. It's stunning and amazing. It is amazing. I was a Republican for many years. Yes, I know. know. Yes. And uh, the idea that the political party uh, of... uh, Wanda Wilkie, Tom Dewey, Alf Landon, Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> Reagan. <would> nominate <laughs> a convicted felon is absurd. But you know what bothered me the most? I want to be completely candid with you and your listeners. What bothered me the most is the Republican Party, uniformly, almost all of them, backed Donald Trump. That there was more of a criticism about the criminal justice system, more of a criticism of, of the judge... Uh, than there was a a reality check about Donald Trump. Uh, I believe that this is just the beginning. Uh, There will be at least three other cases uh, dealing with Donald Trump. One of them, of course, is really critical, and that is the January 6th events. Uh, And I I suggest to you that I wish it would happen before the election. I wish it would, too. Not going to happen. Even if it happens after the election, there is no doubt in my mind that Donald Trump is unfit to be president of the United States. Liz Cheney, the former Republican member of Congress from Wyoming, who is the number three Republican in the House of Representatives, and whose Republican and conservative credentials cannot be questioned, said he must be kept out of the Oval Office, and I believe that is essential as well. Well, I think the one way I look at the Republican Party is it's not a party anymore, it's a movement. No, it's a cult. And it's a cult, but it's also a movement to change America forever, I think, to an authoritarian state. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. And all you have to do is listen to Donald Trump. All you have to do is read the cover story in Time magazine, for God's sake, <laughs> and, and where Donald Trump gave two extensive interviews and made clear what he wants to do. Whenever I hear the Republicans talk about the weaponization of the Justice Department, I, I, I'm stunned because who really wanted to weaponize the Justice Department? Yes. Donald Trump. Yes. And he says it. He says it. When I'm elected, he says, we'll take care of the Biden crime family, all the rest. It is, to me, the saddest reflection. I'm, I'm a political junkie. I've got to tell you, I, I love politics. I love history. I'm the this, same way, John. <laughs> this, is, this is the saddest yes. thing. And, and if you read a history of the Republican Party, Jill, you will read the simple truth is that Donald Trump is the antithesis of everything that the Republican Party stood for. 
So my sense of this is that I hope and I believe that he will be defeated. I believe he'll be defeated overwhelmingly. Uh, and I think that then the Republican Party will have a real challenge. They will have to rebuild without Donald Trump. Now, there may be an embrace of his policies, and I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump's policies in general, but the idea that this man was able to achieve the nomination for the presidency of the United States, uh, given the legal jeopardy he's in, is astounding. Now, one more thing, just, just so we're, we're clear on this. The Republican Party, uh, four years ago, did not adopt a platform. They reaffirmed their commitment to the platform of 2016 and said, and the rest of it is whatever Donald Trump wants. Can you imagine, can you conceive of a major American political party not adopting a platform? No, actually, I can't. And I, ac I had that question on my list about how can the Republican Party not adopt a platform? They're talking about fealty to one man. To me, that's dear leader thinking. And I also kind of remember that we fought a revolutionary war to get out from under the thumb of one man's rule. It's just, it, it just blows my mind. I know. And I, I listened to the Speaker of the House of Representatives uh, blasting the judge, blasting the criminal justice system. I listened to Donald Trump, who took an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, blasting the criminal justice system. Uh, and by the way, the Republicans are rejoicing that tomorrow uh, Hunter Biden will go on trial. Let me remind everybody, Hunter Biden, of course, is guilty. He should never have owned a gun. There's no question about his guilt. Right. But Hunter Biden is not president of the United States of America. Right. Hunter Biden's name is not on the ballot. The name on the ballot is Donald John Trump. And uh, my, my real belief is, maybe because I'm something of an idealist, and I do believe in the American system, I believe the American people will absolutely repudiate Donald Trump on November 5th. That is my hope is in the American people, too. Speaker of the House, senators, House of Representatives standing there, all dressed in the same outfit. I, I, and, and it's support of someone who I call a sexual predator. I mean, we know that he was found... Um, he was found guilty, guilty of being a sexual predator. He found guilty of that, and that over 20 women have come... I forget the number now, but it's over 20 women have come forward. Oh. And now he's a, convict, a convicted felon. And yet, <laughs> you know, they seem trapped in their own logic of their own of trapped in logic of their own lives, or ill logic of their own lies, I, I, I don't understand. Well, I can tell you, Eric Trump and uh, Laura Trump, who is now the vice chair of the Republican Party, and she said it this morning, it's, it's, it's Donald Trump's party. Best summed up by Donald Trump Jr. on the ellipse on January 6th, on that infamous day, yes. when he said, this is no longer the Republican Party, it is the party of Donald Trump. And that, to me, was the most horrific idea, concept that ever could have been voiced. So I know you and I agree, and I think most of the people listening uh, to your wonderful radio show uh, will agree with us. This is a, a dark day for America, but that means we have to fight back. That means we have to stand firm. One other quick point here is the people who are being talked about for the vice presidency of the United States on the Trump ticket, all of whom have had to uh, kneel and kiss the ring, so to speak, uh, and their statements are absurd. Can you believe that these vice presidential candidates uniformly have said that if they had been Mike Pence, they would have accepted the objection to the electoral vote count, which would have, well, would have been a great blow to American democracy. So this is another factor for me. I'm listening carefully to what the syncophants in the Republican Party are saying, and I... I I'm distressed. Look, I'm used to a Republican Party where there were great arguments. Once upon a time, there was a liberal wing of the Republican Party and a conservative wing of the Republican Party. And, uh, and we battled. Uh, and the tragic thing is, and I use this as another example, uh, Donald Trump, I believe him when he says what he's going to do in a second. Term. I believe him, too. He made clear that he was going to see Roe v. Wade overturned. And I'm going to tell you, right here, right now. Uh, anybody who believes in the right of a woman to control her own body uh, cannot vote for Donald Trump. Uh, he is a man who is the ultimate, 
he was honest in his statement, but the justices he's put on the court, can you imagine? We Look, I work for Richard Nixon, and uh, when the United States versus Richard Nixon case came before the uh, Supreme Court, uh, it was an 8 nothing decision. The ninth justice, uh, my old friend Bill Rehnquist, uh, he recused himself because he knew everybody in the Nixon Justice Department. He knew them all. He did the right thing. Can you imagine that Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito are refusing to recuse themselves in the case of immunity, for blanket immunity for a president? We are going to find out within the month how the Supreme Court will rule on this question of blanket immunity. I would not be surprised to see those two justices uphold the right of blanket immunity. But I'm hopeful that the Supreme Court will observe uh, the United States versus Richard Nixon uh, and affirm the point that no president is above the law. Well, just to get back to your vice president, you know, the people that are wanting to be vice president with Trump, I think they're anticipating his one interview question is, what will you do for me? And they, they've already said, I would do what Pence wouldn't do. And I, you know, and I have to bring up Christy Noem. I think that whole, the whole book and letting people know she shot her dog was her interview for the position because she is able to say through that, I will do anything for you. If you want babies ripped out of mother's arms and the United States is going to have to live with that for the rest of our uh, history, rip babies out of mother's arms, I'm willing to do it because I'll shoot a puppy in the face. Look, Christy Nome is a, an unmitigated disaster, but I don't think she will be the nominee of the, of the Republican no, Party. No, uh, I think not that now. right now he is looking at a group of Republicans uh, who are willing to do his bidding and who have as few deficits as possible. Look, why do I think Donald Trump is going to lose? Because enough Republicans will not vote for him. I'd remind you that Nikki Haley, even after her candidacy was ended, was still getting about 20% of the Republican vote. Without a solid Republican backing, Donald Trump can't win. But, John, uh, Nikki Haley said she'd vote for Trump and is backing him. Yes, she is. <laughs> and let me tell you, that's, she did it for one reason, to preserve her political future. But I don't think her statement will influence how Republicans vote. I, I honestly Good. believe, and I, I talk to a lot of Republicans, um, and I, I talk to a lot of Trump supporters. They know there's a problem here. But can you imagine Donald Trump, who says he would end the war in Ukraine by simply giving the Russians what they want? Yes, that's uh, what Can he you said. imagine no. this man in charge of American foreign policy? But even worse, even worse, why was aid delayed to Ukraine? It was delayed because Donald Trump gave the order to his Republican minions in the House of Representatives to obstruct it. Now, I don't like Speaker Johnson. I think Speaker Johnson is a disgrace. But I'm going to tell you, he did the right thing in getting the aid to Ukraine and the aid to Israel uh, through the House of Representatives. And I don't think Donald Trump was exactly thrilled with it, but the two are now in bed together, and that's simply the reality. When the decision came down in New York, Speaker Johnson was attacking the court. And can you imagine Republicans in the House of Representatives went to New York and went either into the courtroom or outside the courtroom and made clear they supported Donald Trump? Does evidence not matter? No. I mean, is, <laughs> no. It, it, let me just, one other thing. Their leader say matters. Mm -hmm. I know. What bothered me more than anything else is every time I listen to the Republicans, I listen to all the talk shows today, they all talk about the fact that they claim Biden has weaponized the Justice Department. Let me tell you something. The true weaponization of the Justice Department are found in, Ronald, in, uh, in Donald Trump's own words. He said, if I'm elected, I'm going to turn the Justice Department loose on the Biden crime family. Can you imagine such a statement? So, to me, Donald Trump is... Uh, is just a, an unbelievably tragic figure for America and American politics. You know what I want more than anything else? I want to live another 30 years because I want to see what history says about Donald Trump and the Republican Party. And I'm also going to be interested, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, if not today, then after the election, how the Republican Party rebuilds. 
how do they gain credibility again? And uh, the, that, to me, is important because we need a two-party system in the United States. Well, I agree with you, and it just seems that there is no line the Republican Party won't cross. I guess that one line is shooting your puppy in the face. You are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7, 89.5, and 89.7 FM. Many voices, one station. Listen globally online from the ksqd.org website. Our topic today is Around the Political World with John Rothman. John is a renowned radio talk show host, popular lecturer, and political and foreign policy consultant. Now John has a popular podcast titled Around the Political World with John Rothman. For direct, short, insightful commentary, listen to John's podcast. Each podcast focuses on different issue in order to shine a spotlight on what is happening in our world today. Current events are fast-paced, and getting a glimpse behind the headlines is critical. So subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Did you know that six corporations own 90% of the media in the United States? Isn't it about time we own some, too? KSQD 90.7 FM, your community radio station, your voice, your concerns. Go to www.ksqd.org to get involved and support locally owned grassroots community media. K-Squid, KSQD FM. Hello, K-Squid listeners. I'm Todd Hartman, and each weekday at 4 p.m., I bring you a different perspective on the news than you're likely to hear on most media outlets. Please join me on KSQD Santa Cruz, your ink spot on the dial for the Tom Hartman program, heard now for the first time ever in the Monterey Bay area at 90.7 FM, weekdays at 4 p.m. That's progressive talking conversation with me, Tom Hartman, weekdays at 4 p.m. on KSQD 90.7 FM. Tag, you're it. We're back. Would you like a friend to hear this interview on Around the Political World with John Rothman? As John has a podcast, so does Be Bold America. We're available uh, on Apple, Google, Spotify, Breaker, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and YouTube. Subscribe for free from your favorite podcast platform or listen on Be Bold America's homepage on the ksqd.org website. I also want to give a shout out to our listeners in the United States and Canada, but also especially to those overseas in Germany, the United Kingdom, Austria, Algeria, and Ireland. Thank you for listening. And by the way, John, thinking of our listeners in other countries, what would you want to say to them about what is happening right now in the United States today? Look, this is a lesson in democracy. America has survived, the United States has survived many challenges. I always remember the Watergate scandal, and I would remind you we're on the 50th anniversary now of Watergate. Uh, And many of us were disgusted by what happened during Watergate. But the one thing that we have to remember is the American system worked. The courts worked. The Congress worked. uh, The press worked. And in the end, even the American presidency worked. And that's the thing. The American system is designed in a way that excesses can be reined in. And I think that the lesson of American democracy is that in the end, even if we make mistakes along the way, we try to do the right thing. And I believe the American people will rise to the occasion. The leadership of the United States and the world is too important and uh, too vital. And I think the American people understand that. And that's why I think uh, the Donald Trump will be roundly defeated. And let me make one other quick point about Joe Biden. I've supported Joe Biden over many, many years, and I realize his strengths and weaknesses. Being 81 years old and being not the man he was when I first met him, and let me be clear about that. I've known him for many years. Uh, Joe Biden is still on top of the game in terms of running the presidency. And if you take a look at what he has accomplished in these last three and a half years, uh, it's a remarkable record of accomplishment. And so I, I believe that Biden will be reelected. It is true, and everybody should be aware of this, that who the vice president is matters tremendously. And that's why Kamala Harris will be contrasted with whoever a Donald Trump nominates. Somebody asked me, what do I think about Kamala Harris? The first radio talk show she ever appeared on was mine. Oh. Before she was a candidate for political office, uh, we were talking about trafficking, sex trafficking. 
she was brilliant then, and I believe her years uh, as uh, the district attorney of San Francisco, as attorney general of California, in the United States Senate, now almost four years as vice president, she's fully equipped and able to become the uh, president of the United States if called on to do so. And I want to make clear that vice presidents are generally the butt of jokes. <laughs> Remember uh, Thomas Riley Marshall, who was Woodrow Wilson's vice president, once said uh, the mother had two sons. One went to sea, the other became vice president, and neither one was ever heard from again. <laughs> and, of course, uh, Harry Truman once remarked that uh, being vice president is about as useful as being a cow's fifth teat. <laughs> <laughs> you, I can make jokes about the vice presidency forever, but I do want to remind you that the vice presidency is not an office where you can judge a person in terms of success or failure. Being vice president, you serve at the whim of the president, and I have no doubt that uh, Kamala Harris will be the Democratic nominee for vice president. And if something should happen to Joe Biden, she, I believe, would be the Democratic nominee for president. And certainly... Uh, uh, she has all the qualifications and experience now uh, to be a candidate. One of the things that bothers me is the ridicule heaped on Kamala Harris. I know. By so many, and those of us who know her, those of us who work with her, she's not perfect, but neither was Harry Truman. You know what they called Truman? The senator from Pendergast, because boss Pendergast put him uh, in right. the position of the senator. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that a vice president who becomes president uh, has then the opportunity to write their own uh, approach. So I, I expect that uh, Kamala Harris will play a large role in American history. Just a dovetail on what you're saying about Biden and versus is that we really have, really, choice in November is very simple. We have one political party that embraces democracy and one political party that has abandoned it and is actively moving towards an authoritarian state. So, you know, it is, to me, a very simple choice. Forgetting the noise and all the spin, and when you walk into that voting booth, you need to decide which one are you going to support. Uh, uh, our democracy of nearly 250 years and what our founding fathers designed, or something someone wants that looks like what Putin is doing. So, yeah, I, I can't disagree with you. I mean, I hate to say it, uh, and particularly for those who are too, listening from John. overseas, yes. uh, the, what Donald Trump represents for America is the worst in America. And uh, that's, that's the thing that everybody needs to understand. And I have to say this, and I believe this, and you'll interview me, I'm sure, again, uh, perhaps before, maybe after the election. I, that's why Trump is going to lose. The American people have too much good common sense. And for those who ask, why is he doing so well? Because in part, he leads a cult. Do you remember when Donald Trump said, I could shoot someone in the middle of Fifth Avenue and my supporters would still back me? Yes, I that do. That is the problem. Look, I have worked for a lot of candidates. Some I've liked, some I haven't liked, some I believed in, some I didn't necessarily believe in. But in the end... I view this as a judgment the American people will make on the future of American democracy. And when Joe Biden speaks this week on the anniversary of D-Day, I think he will talk directly about the question of democracy and what democracy means. And I hate to say this, I say it with deep sadness and regret. Donald Trump is the antithesis of American democracy. And he's also the antithesis of what the Christian religion should want. We, the evangelicals uh, in America, are a powerful force. One third of the American people are evangelical or born again Christians, as we used to call them. One third? One third. Wow. And so the question you have to ask is how can these people of faith vote for a person who <laughs> is completely without faith? And we know that. Remember when he stood in front of that church a yes. few years ago? With the Bible, the upside, Bible down. upside down? Yes. That's exactly what he would do to America. He'd turn it upside down. Well, as Thomas Franks, uh, he was a psych... Well, I think he's still a professor at Georgetown University. He wrote uh, Trump on the Couch, and he said Trump is a destroyer. That he's, he's destroyed when he was a little kid. He destroyed other children's toys. He, dest he destroys whatever he touches, and he's, 
you know, willing to destroy America. And if he gets into office again, uh, he'll destroy the planet because nothing would happen around the climate emergency. Well, he, he has made clear uh, of his opposition to the Paris Accords. Uh, he has made clear that if he becomes president, he, he would weaponize the Justice Department. He has made clear his positions on a woman's right to choose. You can go down the list of issues and understand the danger he represents. And people, the American people don't necessarily vote for. They vote against. And my hope is that the overwhelming majority of people in this country will understand what Donald Trump represents and vote against him. And let me tell you, it's, it's not... I respect people who are Republicans and who have conservative, so-called conservative points of view. Yes. But I do not respect those who are willing to overlook the danger of Donald Trump. Well, I think, um, you know, when you're talking about weaponizing the, the judicial system or the attorney general's office, I'm thinking Jim Jordan's committee, the weaponization of government committee, is the precursor for that, figuring right. out how they could do it. And Jim Jordan, if you really understand his record and his background, is again the antithesis of the person who should be leading the House Judiciary Committee. And what record? I don't know of anything he's done. I'm talking about what he hasn't done, but yeah. what he said. Yes, right. His defense of Donald Trump throughout everything. And obviously, that's the challenge the Democrats have as well. I believe the Democrats are going to take the House of Representatives. I believe that with all my heart. Oh, I hope so. Uh, I'm concerned, and by the way, Hakeem Jeffries is an excellent individual, and he'll make a fine speaker. What worries me is the Senate. Uh, although I think the Democrats now have a shot at taking the Senate as well, in large measure because the Republican Party is so tied to Donald Trump, and I think a lot of the people who've supported him are going to lose their Senate uh, races. Uh, but this is... Uh, this is a challenge for America. You know, we always say every election is the most important election in American history. And that's probably true. This election <laughs> is the most important election in my lifetime. I agree. And the most important one in deciding whether we have a democracy or not. You're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7, 89.5, and 89.7 FM, Many Voices, One Station. Listen globally online from the KSQD.org website. Today's bold guest is John Rothman. John is a renowned radio talk show host, popular lecturer, and political and foreign policy consultant. John has been a professor at the University of San Francisco from Institute since 2004, and he also has a fast-growing 10-minute podcast called Around the Political World with John Rothman, five days a week, so sub subscribe for free to hear his daily thoughts on urgent domestic and foreign events. We will be right back after Jim Hightower's commentary titled Return of the Swamp Drainer, Making a Mockery of Democracy. Remember the swamp drainer? In 2016, presidential candidate Donald Trump promised to end the grubby money corruption of American politics. The special interest lobbyist donors, he rightly and righteously noted, make large contributions to politicians and they have total control of those politicians. Asserting that he knows the political rot better than anyone, he said he would fix that system because that system is wrong. Eight years later, here comes the Donald again. But the swamp is bigger and suckier than ever. And instead of bold talk about draining it, Trump is auctioning off the swamp, flagrantly offering direct presidential benefits to big oil, Wall Street hucksters, high-tech tycoons, and all other moneyed interests that, quote, make large contributions to him. How large? The Washington Post reports that one businessman asked to have lunch with Trump, promising a million-dollar check. I'm not having lunch, Trump retorted. You've got to make it $25 million. He has also demanded a cool billion bucks from a covey of big oil executives, promising to cut their corporate taxes and deliver an array of other special benefits. The presidential wannabe punctuated his itemization of political goodies with an unsettled monetary nudge, saying, Be generous, please. 
This is Jim Hightower saying, since a Supreme Court majority of extreme partisans opened the floodgates 14 years ago, corrupt corporate cash has gone from merely polluting American democracy to now swamping it. Trump is not the only bribe huckster, but he is the most blatant, shamelessly nuclearizing the going rate for buying public policy, mocking the ideal of a citizen's government. Trump himself is fond of telling fat cat donors that he doesn't spend 10 minutes with anyone who can't give $10 million. Hello, where does that leave you and me and our country? The Hightower Radio Lowdown is made possible by you subscribers to Jim Hightower's Lowdown on Substack. Find us at jimhightower.substack.com. We're back. Our topic today is Around the Political World with John Rothman. And our bold guest is that very John Rothman. Learn more at johnrothman.com, and that is Rothman with two N's. Now, John, after hearing Jim Hightower's commentary, do you have any thoughts, especially around the Supreme Court Citizens United decision that legalized bribing our politicians? I want to talk more about the Supreme Court and actually what our founding fathers designed to be the Supreme Court versus what it is now, but thoughts on Jim Hightower's commentary there and Citizens United? Well, Citizens United has to be thrown out, and the only way you do that is if you have a Supreme Court that that is willing to rule that way. Uh, I often remember something that Shirley Breyer Black said to me. She was uh, Justice Stephen Breyer's aunt, and she said to me, can you imagine if Al Gore had won in, in 2000? It would have been the Breyer Court, because Breyer would have been elevated to the Chief Justiceship. Who sits on the Supreme Court and the position they hold is critical. And I would suggest to you that one of the key reasons why it's important that Joe Biden be reelected is because uh, I want to make sure the people nominated for the court are people who are in sync with American democracy. Uh, and uh, that requires a different president. It is the presidential appointment, or nomination to be more precise, to the Supreme Court, which matters. So who is president matters. When we vote for a president, we're not just voting for a president, we're voting for a future of the Supreme Court. Remember, the only president of the United States uh, in recent memory who did not nominate anybody to the court because there were no vacancies was Jimmy Carter. And had Jimmy Carter had a nomination, it would have gone to Lawrence Tribe. And Lawrence mm, Tribe is one of the great fabulous. thinkers and jurists yes. uh, in, the, in the United States. Yes. <clears throat> well, I would contend that uh, uh, Trump didn't nominate any Supreme Court justices. The Federalist Society did. He just went from the list and picked somebody. There wasn't any reasoning on his part other than doing what the Federalist Society wanted. But he made a promise. He did. And, uh, this is very important. He did. That's why what he says in his interviews is so critical. He made a promise to appoint justices or nominate justices to the court who would overturn Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. Tell us, John, how did, what did the Founding Fathers do to design the Supreme Court? How did they envision a, a Supreme Court? With no uh, real supervision. Uh, and they were right. You know, the idea was that if you put good people on the court, uh, and if they never had to worry about a reappointment, that uh, they would, in fact, do their job, that they would rise to the level of caring about the Constitution. What they did not take into account was that a group of strong ideologues, and you mentioned the Federalist Society, I yes. also mentioned the Heritage Foundation, that a group of people gathered around those philosophical points would have a president who would simply appoint them to the bench. And that is the, the critical thing. But I am not in favor of expanding the court. Uh, we could discuss at great length Franklin Roosevelt's uh, packing of the Supreme Court concept from 1937. I'm not in favor of packing the Supreme Court. What I want are justices who are nominated, who are good, solid, thinking individuals, neither left nor right. Uh, and that is one of the things which we really have to uh, to seek and hope for. So what do we do with those who are already on it, such as Alito and Thomas? There's and, nothing uh, you can do. Nothing you can do. There has do. been only one impeachment of a justice of the Supreme Court, and that was in 1805, 
and uh, Justice Chase survived and was not removed from the bench. He was impeached, right. but not removed. We have never had a situation where any justice of the court has been removed by impeachment. We had Abe Fortas, who did the unthinkable thing of taking $10,000 in the Wolfson Foundation, and he wasn't impeached. He chose to resign. Why? Because he felt the integrity of the court was more important than anything. Well, he had and, the ability to be shamed. <laughs> you know, but I'll tell you, it's an interesting thing. I, I did not know Justice Fortas well, but I met him on a number of occasions. We had a wonderful lunch together at one point. He loved the court, and he loved the law, and he would do nothing to compromise the integrity of the Supreme Court. And I think that's the key. Uh, you want to have justices, and Bill Rehnquist, look, I didn't agree with Bill Rehnquist on almost anything, mm -hmm. but he had the courage to recuse himself in the Nixon case because he'd worked in the Nixon Justice Department. Uh, in other words, you can be an ideological conservative, but you can rise to the top. Now, let me just say that within the month, I believe the Supreme Court will rule on the question of blanket immunity, immunity. for president. Yes, this is scary. And, well, it, it could be, but maybe not. If they follow the precedent of the United States versus Richard Nixon, it will fail. Trump's logic will fail. I believe that Thomas and Alito may vote to uphold that concept, but I believe, I want to believe, that the rest of the Supreme Court will reject the notion of blanket immunity. No one in America should have blanket immunity. No one should be above the law. And I think that is the critical thing. So, although I know we're concentrating on a lot of different things today, watch this case in the Supreme Court. It will be, I think, one of the most important decisions the court will make dealing with the power of the presidency. Yes, yes. And then we have to talk about the flags that Alito is flying. Um, flags represent values. The American flag represents American values, freedom and liberty and equality for all. And flying it over his private property, uh, blaming his wife, which is, is unbelievable to do that, but then saying he supports his wife's... Um, uh, freedom to choose, which I just wanted to gag on, <laughs> you know. Well, she has a right to express her opinion. Yes, but he... But she is married to a yes. justice yes. of the United States Supreme Court, and that flagpole in front of their home flew the American flag upside down. Now, I was stunned when Alito said he didn't know that's what it meant. That, uh, oh, distress. I don't believe him. Did he not live through the Vietnam War? Exactly. Did he not, has he not lived through days? I mean, this is... The absurdity is what is so disturbing, but no one can force a justice of the Supreme Court to recuse themselves. And the way the rules operate, the House makes its own rules, the Senate makes its own rules, and the Supreme Court makes its own rules. And I will tell you that given the way the court is set up today, there will not be a, any any action taken against Alito and Thomas. And may I say, as, as egregious as what Sam Alito has done, what Clarence Thomas and his wife Ginny have oh done my. are absolutely unbelievable. And so I, I get such a kick out of it. The, the, in this New York case, the judge, the Republicans are going to say, well, the judge should have recused himself because he'd contributed $50 to a Democratic campaign. And I'm thinking, what hypocrisy. Uh, wouldn't they demand the same thing of Alito and Thomas? But let, let's be clear. Alito and Thomas, the way the, the Supreme Court is designed, can only recuse themselves. No one, not even the Chief Justice, can order their recusal. They can't be shamed either. Uh, they, they, they seem shameless. I, just to continue a little bit on... Uh, Alito's flag flying is that there were two of them. Let I mean, me the other one, one on the other property, too. Go ahead. Right, let me just correct one thing. Okay. It isn't shame. They believe oh. that they are doing the right thing. Mm. It was the same thing with Roe v. Wade. These are not people who abdicate what they think is the right thing to do. They're doing what they think is the right thing to do. And we should never underestimate the power of ideology. Yes. The other thing we need to recognize is when, when Donald Trump's nominees for the Supreme Court came before the Senate Judiciary Committee, all of them spoke eloquently about upholding existing precedent. 
And yet we knew, and I talked about it on KGO, we knew that once they got on the court, they would vote to overturn Roe v. Wade. And all I can say to you is, all you can do is ask them a question. Somebody asked me, can you go back now knowing that they lied? And the answer is no. No. You can't. And that's the, that's the, the truth of it. Well, the Supreme Court, to me... Um Seems compromised to me. Uh, you've got at least two, and maybe Barrett, who was raised in a cult herself, they're compromised by that ideology or by being zealots. And the urgency and ferocity with which they have been ripping our Constitution to shreds just seems driven by their knowledge of their own illegitimacy. But, they, but you see, they don't view it as illegitimate. They view it as exactly what the country needs. Wow. And, and one of the other things that we should point out, you don't, you're too young perhaps to remember uh, Impeach Earl Warren and the, the signs that went up all over the country put up by the John Birch Society. But the Warren court was accused by the conservatives of being anti-America. Uh, because of all of their decisions, uh, uh, particularly Roe v. Wade uh, and, and many others, it is hard to separate one's personal ideology. Uh, and sometimes we're wrong. Remember that Felix Frankfurter uh, was a liberal when Franklin Roosevelt put him on the court and became one of the most conservative members of the court. Uh, let me remind you that uh, Hugo Black, before he was in the Senate, uh, and uh, or when he was in the Senate, and, and before he went to the Supreme Court, was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. People can change. People can evolve. But what we've learned now is there is a real litmus test, and that's why we're mentioning of the Heritage Foundation uh, and, uh, and the whole approach of ideological, ideological purity is so dangerous. Well, that's uh, what Project 25 is. You know, we, let's talk about Project 25. Yes, let's Have talk about Project 25. Project 25, for God's sake. Just, wait, before we do that, can I just tell you a little story? Of course. I had a very good friend, uh, Dick Nathan, who wrote a book called the, uh, He wrote a book on the plot that Richard Nixon had to take over America uh, by administrative action. Uh, and that is exactly what Donald Trump is doing. He is suggesting through Project 25 the whole approach of an administrative presidency. And that is what is so dangerous. It is a plot to destroy America as we know it. But nobody's talking about it, but thank God you are. Yes, and, I, and for those who don't know what it is, it's titled Mandate for Leadership, A Conservative Promise. And it's, it's really a guide uh, of the extreme right-wing agenda for the Republican administration. And I don't think it's a conservative promise. Uh, no. What I, no. What I understand of conservatism is it's not Project 25, where they are, you know, they just right now are interviewing people to replace the entire federal government. They say 50,000 positions. They just want to, to fire them all and put in their people and then... And then stop any protections on re reproductive rights, LGBTQ and civil rights, climate change efforts, immigration. And it's been designed uh, by the Heritage Foundation, but it's also been signed onto by, I think, hundreds of others. Um, it's to keep people around Donald Trump. Yes. This is a Donald Trump proposition. Well, they've also said, though, that if Donald Trump loses, this is also a Republican the next Republican president. They're not going to put it in a drawer somewhere. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is it's, it, it's a plot to take over America. Yes. And that was what Richard Nathan, Dick Nathan, wrote about in his book about the plot that Nixon's people had. The same concept. And had Watergate not interrupted, Nixon might have tried to pull it off. So this is really... I'm so glad you mentioned this. It, it shows you're doing your research, which is <laughs> Thank uh, you. a lot of radio talk show hosts don't do that. But this is a very important thing, and you can Google it, and you can read about it, and you should all read about it to understand how scary this is. And by the way, the other thing you've got to read is the Time Magazine cover story on Donald Trump from about a month ago. Yes. What he would do if he's reelected. Yes. It's, it's just, it's 
antithetical to everything America believes. That's right. And MediaMatters.org has a good analysis of Project 25 as well, but you, anybody can just um, plug just that into Project your browser. 25. Right, and you'll learn a lot. If you're just joining us, my bold guest is John Rothman. John is a renowned radio talk show host, popular lecturer, and political and foreign policy consultant. He also has a fast-growing podcast called Around the World, Political World with John Rothman, and it, it contains direct, short, insightful commentary. So listen to John's podcast, because each focuses on a different issue in order to shine a spotlight on what is happening in our world today. Subscribe for free to hear his daily 10-minute Thoughts on Urgent and Domestic Foreign Events. To learn more, visit John Rothman, that's with two N's, johnrothman.com. You are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD, 90.7, 89.5, and 89.7 FM. Many voices, one station. I'm your host, Jill Cody. And stay tuned to KSQD this evening at 6 p.m. for State of Mind, hosted by Santa Cruz licensed psychotherapist Deborah Sloss. It's a sobering reality that one in five girls and one in 20 boys will experience childhood sexual abuse before they reach 18. Deborah's guests are survivor and author Alreen Hayquist and Stephanie Klein, licensed clinical social worker and trauma specialist. They discuss the often long and complex journey of healing from the trauma of childhood sexual abuse. While covering difficult territory, this episode, crafted for both survivors and their loved ones, emphasizes that recovery is possible through courage, resilience, and self-discovery. That's State of Mind this evening at 6 p.m. here on KSQD, 89.5, 89.7, and 90.7 FM, and ksqd.org. We're back. John, in these last few minutes, I'd like to ask what ideas you might have for us to keep doing, stop doing, and start doing. However, I just wanted to ask you a couple of other things first. Do you think our democracy can survive Fox so-called news that intentionally divides America from Americans and their formula is to go after the lizard brain, you know, the amygdala and keep people aggrieved and outraged and their anchors can buy islands and, you know, and, we, and the whole right wing uh, radio shows, there's 1,500 of them, I think, and then there's Newsmax and there's nothing like that on the uh, progressive or or Democratic side, this structure. What are your thoughts on all that? Fox and news is an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah. it, it simply is. By the way, the book by Richard Nathan, just so everybody knows, I'm already getting emails about this, people asking me. Uh, it is the plot that failed, and it is the complete analysis of what the Nixon people tried to do and the Trump people are trying to do now. The plot that failed. Yeah, by Richard Nathan. I Thank recommend you. it. It's, it's the blueprint that the Trump people are using. Nobody remembers the book. But I knew Dick Nathan, and, uh, and uh, I actually interviewed him about the book. I'm going to check it out, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, look, the only thing we can do when it comes to something like Fox, I was at a dinner party, and a woman asked to be seated next to me. I was delighted. And uh, I had listened coming in to Sean Hannity. And she proceeded, sitting next to me, to recite the whole Sean Hannity monologue. Oh, my. And I looked her in the eye and I said, oh, driving down here, you must have been listening to Sean Hannity. And she looked at me incredulous. How did you know? <laughs> I listen to Hannity. I listen to Mark Levin. And I, I must tell all of you, uh, I suffer from low blood pressure. And the way I elevate my blood <laughs> pressure is by listening to those shows. It is so outrageous, so egregious. And... There is no liberal counterpart. There is no progressive counterpart. But there is no rational counterpart either. They're never challenged. And those of you who listen to me on KGO know I welcomed challenges. I welcomed dissent. I welcomed a variety of opinions. I think that's what's so critical, uh, to make a talk show interesting. But Fox is a danger to the American system. And I only wish that we had a counterbalance in talk radio. One of the great tragedies uh, here in San Francisco, there is no radio talk show station in San Francisco. I know, a crime. Uh, fourth largest market in America. 
but I can tell you, uh, I felt like I'd gone to my own funeral. I, when, when we were pulled the plug on the, on the station, the emails and the letters I received were just astounding. Mm. And where do people go now? That's the problem. Where do you get the correction? If you listen to Mark Levin, if you listen to Sean Hannity, if you listen to Laurie Ingram, what you hear is, is nonsense. I mean, I hate to say it. It's not that they're not entertaining. It's not that they're not capable. Their ideology blinds them to intelligent discussion. And so in the old days, we had a fairness doctrine in, on radio and TV, and something like what exists now could not have existed then, because Fox is overtly plugging for Donald Trump to be elected president. So it, Hannity it, 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 was it, it, out there campaigning on the stages with them, which I found so offensive. I know, but that it's, it's not... You understand, I don't mind if somebody has a partisan point of view. I really don't. Uh, but that's what a radio talk show is about, or a television talk show. Well, they're supposed to be a news organization. He's supposed to be a journalist, and that's what, what I found well, offensive by of course. calling themselves that. I don't mind him having a... Per, uh, a personal point of view, however, using his position. And people believe him. Do you understand? Yes, yes. If you travel uh, around the country and you go to talk radio stations across the country, it's basically Hannity, Levin, Laura Ingram, one or two other radio talk shows who are all very far to the right. That's it. They don't hear anything else. And Roger Ailes did say... You know, I, I, Gabe Sherman's book, The Loudest Voice in the Room. Right. You know, he said, we have no obligation to tell the viewer anything not to our advantage. And what his advantage was, was to monetize politics, to be able to make money off of journalism. And he knew that the view viewers uh, wanted to feel welcome and safe and separate from people that weren't like them. So that, again, divides... It does, and that's the big challenge. Don't you get it? Don't, yeah. don't our listeners get it? The challenge is that America now is more divided than I've ever seen it. And it depends who you listen to for your news source as to what you believe. And my appeal to people is keep your minds open. Yes. Understand, when you have a former president of the United States convicted on 34 felony counts, and when you know that the, and not only, not to mention uh, the fact that he did attack a woman and was found guilty of that, and we're still dealing with uh, with January sixth. We've hardly talked about talked it. About that. Well, in the two minutes, two two minutes we have left, <laughs> John, <laughs> I could talk to you all afternoon. Um, and 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 that and that is what ideas do you have for us to keep doing, stop doing, and start doing? I don't want to just complain. I want people to, no, we have to know work. what we could do. We have to Our future to depends on it. Candidates. Yes, we have to join Democratic clubs. We have to organize as surely as the right is organizing. The genuine Americans who love our country and want to preserve democracy have to unite behind those candidates who will make a difference in our lives. Uh, and it doesn't mean I have to like them all equally or that they don't have deficits to themselves. But how are they going to vote? That's the key. So I urge political activism. I urge people to think. I urge people to listen to radio right wing, left wing, whatever you want to listen to, but make up your own minds and know what's true and what isn't. And multiple sources. Right. I, I read everything. I read everything. I read a lot, too, or listen to a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, that, that's the key. And I only wish that uh, we had a true talk radio station in San Francisco where people could call in and express their point of view. And ideas could be shared uh, on how to... Be active. There's indivisible. There's writing postcards and supporting the Democratic parties in the in the red states. I mean, yeah. they think California. What can I do? Well, you can help Democratic parties in the red states. John, thank you for being our bold and impressive guest today. It was delightful to talk with you. Thank you for giving us an hour of your valuable time it's and my your pleasure. insights. And let us hope that the current Republican plot fails yes. as surely as it must. It must. Again, thank you for being a friend of the show. And remember, subscribe to John's podcast, Around the Political World with John Rothman, and learn more at johnrothman.com. What's up next on Be Bold America? 
Please join us on Sunday, June 16th for From Ronald to Donald, How the Myth of Reagan Became the Cult of Trump, when Ed Oswald will be our next bold guest and who served as an attorney advisor in the Clinton administration. Ed Oswald says... The Reagan presidency was a springboard into our current political, economic, and cultural era. Call it what you will, the DNA of Reagan's economic policy lives on some 40 years later. In his new book, From Ronald to Donald, Ed Oswald examines Reagan's life and the power of the Reagan myth that still burns brightly in the American psyche. Please join Be Bold America on Sunday, June 16th at 5 p.m. to hear how Ronald Reagan made tax cuts the centerpiece of his 1980 campaign for the presidency, and 40 years later, Donald Trump honored his legacy by signing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act into law, the largest overhaul of the tax code the country had seen since Reagan. Now, we all must be alert to the fact that the 2024 election will carry, among many other serious issues, significant implications for tax policy that will no doubt affect you. As a reminder, Be Bold America is available as a podcast. Now you may listen to the show anytime for free by subscribing through your favorite podcast platform. Also, you may reach me or any others here at the station at info at ksqd.org. I want to give a special thank you to our talented Be Bold America's program engineer, Eliza James, and to our station's tireless program director, Howard Feldstein. You are listening to KSQD Santa Cruz and KSQD Prunedale. Many voices, one station. Listen worldwide online at ksqd.org. Stay tuned for State of Mind with Deborah Schloss. My name is Jill Cody, and thank you for listening to Be Bold America. Until next time, keep, stop, start. Stop, start.